I'd like to start by acknowledging uh, the Menang people, the traditional owners of the land on which we meet tonight. Uh, so as Julian said, I would like to talk to you tonight about um, early contact images that were made in the King George Sound area uh, by various European explorers who um, came to this place and I will finish up uh, looking um, in some detail at the image of Old Farm Strawberry Hill that Julian also referred to. My talk will unfold in a largely chronological manner and I think that that's fine because it is a kind of, it's a chrono chronological story that we have in terms of contact between Europeans and this particular, um, this particular area. And also the knowledge that those European peoples built um, unfolded over time in a chronological manner. And I would suggest also that perhaps the knowledge of the local Menang people also um, built over time as those in moments of encounter um, continued to happen through the, um, through the 19th century. So the start really of the image making um, for this area starts in the late 18th century at the tail end of what we refer to really as the age of reason. It's a time when uh, Europeans, particularly the French and the English, uh, engaged in voyages around the globe. Uh, they're interested uh, at this stage really in scientific exploration and discovery. The interest is very much in geography but also the natural sciences. And in order for these voyages of discovery, as they were <laughs> known or as we refer to them, uh, it was very important for ships, crews to actually um, include a range of individuals with scientific skills and knowledge. So as well as, um, certainly in the British case, largely naval um, um, officers and so forth on the ships, we also had astronomers, botanists and zoologists particularly included uh, on the voyages, but also it was absolutely essential to have artists on, bo on board as well. And their role being very much to create the visual record of those encounters, so to actually document um, objects of the natural history that they encountered, but also the uh, geologic and the geographic. Uh, so the first set of images that we have here are from Vancouver's um, visit to the King George Sound area in 1791. Um, Vancouver was sent out, as you're probably aware, um, to uh, make various surveys and in particular he was given the task of looking at that part of New Holland in which there was a gap in the knowledge of what the coastline actually looked like. It was referred to as being a blot in geography, that kind of lack of knowledge. And one of the people on board with Vancouver was the naval artist John Sykes. And it was Sykes's job particularly to produce coastal profiles. It was one of the very key um, tasks of naval draftsmen aboard these ships was to produce what we refer to as, as coastal profiles. They obviously providing a very, very specific purpose in terms of information then to later voyagers and, and sailors. So what we have um, here on the left-hand side uh, are two examples of Sykes's coastal profiles. This is around the, um, uh, the Capes area, and this is actually the entrance into King George Sound here. And the task of the naval draftsman in terms of producing these profiles, as I said, was to make them uh, clearly recognisable um, for future voyages. Sykes was known as being particularly good at producing coastal profiles. Some other artists um, tended to embellish what they saw somewhat, uh, but Sykes remained um, fairly strict in his topographical rendering. And he was, it, I apologise for the, the images, um, but he was very good at indicating distance as well so that um, uh, experienced sailors could read these rocks, read um, then, in a sense, an understanding of the distance of them then from the shore behind, and that was certainly one of the things that um, Sykes, uh, as I said, had a, a very good reputation for. So Sykes and Vancouver um, make land um, at King George Sound. They arrive here at the end of September uh, 1791 and stay until about the 12th of October. And while here, Vancouver, as I'm sure you're aware, um, 
gave the name King George III Sound to um, the body of water and also took possession of the land um, for the British government or for the king at that stage. What I want to look at though as well is the image on the right hand side which is an engraving after a, a watercolour drawing by John Sykes um, which is entitled a, um, a Deserted Indian Village in King George III Sound, New Holland. Uh, the original image was made obviously during the visit in 1791. Uh, the published image appeared, uh, this version at least, in 1798. Um, what I think is very interesting about it is it's our first kind of, if you like, uh, European image that actually has, certainly from this part of the, um, the continent, um, representation at least of Aboriginal inhabitation and occupation of the land. Interestingly, when Vancouver and Sykes and the crew were in King George Sound, they didn't actually meet any of the local people. I suspect that it was the time of year probably contributed to that. Um, so they didn't, as I said, meet any um, of the um, local Manang people, um, which they had hoped to do, but they did leave um, various trinkets, as Vancouver described them, as tokens of their, f of their friendly disposition and in the hope of inducing the natives to um, favour them with a visit. I'll move on to um, this next image again with Sykes's um, landscape. What I find very interesting is that um, Vancouver talks about um, the landscape that they encountered around King George Sound, um, which he described as um, being having a very melancholy aspect, which presented little less than a view of famine and distress. The shores consisted either of steep naked rocks or a milk-white barren sand beyond which dreary boundary the surface of the ground seemed covered by a deadly green herbage, with here and there a few grovelling shrubs or dwarf trees scattered at a great distance from each other. Not quite the image that Sykes has given us at the landscape. And I think the, th the thing to bear in mind is that when you have printed images like Sykes's image that are made for a European audience, what you have the artist actually doing is producing an image that is understandable to that audience. I think if he had actually produced an image of the deadly green herbage and um, the um, dreary boundaries of the landscape of King George Sound, it would not have actually fitted into the um, understanding at the time and the desire at the time to see landscape in a particular way. And I think it's important to remember that in the late 18th century, this is a time when an understanding of viewing the landscape as an image um, starts to be very much bedded down into European culture. Landscape comes to the fore on its own as a way of making uh, images and a way of understanding the natural world. You have uh, a number of theorists who talk about there being particular ways of approaching the landscape, certainly in terms of looking at the landscape as a view. Um, in Britain, there's the notion certainly of the beautiful landscape. There is also the notion of a sublime landscape, which actually fills you with fear or awe um, of the natural world. But there's also the notion of a picturesque landscape, which is something that comes to be understood as something that's appropriate to actually be in a picture. And it has very specific characteristics, which often include, as you can see in Sykes's image, and also I wanted to include these two examples by Thomas Gainsborough, who is one of the key... Um, uh, proponents of the landscape in Britain uh, at the same time in the 18th century. Uh, so you have a slightly shady foreground, um, light falling into the mid-ground of the image, uh, trees on either side that tend to frame the view but also have the appropriate massing um, of shape as well. So even though we're looking at um, eucalypts and probably a bit of Banksia scrub land, they have been morphed, if you like, into what a proper European or tree shape should be to convey the proper image of a landscape. What we also see, though, in the image is the... Um, the notion that the Indian village and the use of Indian as an interchangeable term to talk about Aboriginal people uh, is common throughout the late 18th and 19th century. But what we have with the abandoned image is a sense that um, 
the, the landscape is not occupied. The only figures that we actually see in the landscape are the, um, the two British uh, ships' crew who occupy the middle ground um, of that landscape and become possessors, literally in that image, of the land that Vancouver, in a sense, has taken possession of on behalf of the, um, the British king and the British government. It's also interesting, Vancouver talks about um, this... Um, this, um, the abandoned huts um, that they found, he describes it as being, as with the image, a deserted village of the natives amidst the trees. He describes the huts as being miserable huts, mostly the same fashion and, and dimensions, um, and the sense that it had been the residence previously of um, what could be esteemed a considerable tribe, tribe rather, um, but it did also indicate that perhaps since some of the huts that they'd seen were larger than others, that perhaps they'd still, even as a, um, a tribe, to use his word, had a sense of distinctions or hierarchies within, within the tribe. So trying to make sense of what they're encountering in terms of that English understanding of distinction and some perhaps a kind of class structure um, that's happening, that happens there. The next Europeans to um, make landfall and spend some time in the King George Sound area uh, is Matthew Flinders. His artist um, on board is a, a young man by the name of William Westall. Interestingly, in the case of Flinders Survey um, Village, village Voyage, excuse me, um, of Australia, because Joseph Banks has also been involved in Britain in actually setting up um, or promoting uh, Flinders' ambitions for the voyage, rather than Flinders actually being supplied with a naval artist in this case, he's actually supplied with a professionally trained uh, independent artist. In this case, uh, William Westall, who was a very young man. He'd been training at the Royal Academy for a couple of years, but at 19 years of age, uh, took his chances with Flinders and signed up for a, a couple of years um, voyage around the globe, no doubt hoping that as part of this it would also help to make his reputation as an artist when he returns to, um, to Britain after the voyage. Uh, so again, as I'm sure you're aware, Flinders was in uh, King George Sound from December 1801 through to January 1802. Uh, and he's the first European to record in his journal encounters between the local Manang people and um, the um, Europeans. And he refers on occasions in his journal to our friends, the natives, um, and gives accounts also um, of um, an occasion on the 30th of December when he's drilling the Marines um, uh, on the shore and um, their activities are actually copied um, enacted out also by the, um, the local Manang people who had been observing them. The works of West William Westall are interesting because even though we're talking about a kind of 10-year period on from John Sykes, his training at the Royal Academy gives him a very different understanding of uh, art and image making, and he falls much more into that model of making picturesque images of the lands that he's encountering, much less interested in the what we might think of as more purely scientific um, recording. He did also uh, make coastal, pro coastal profiles uh, for Flinders and also some ethnographic uh, drawings, and you can see on the right-hand side uh, an image of an absolutely beautiful uh, pencil drawing uh, of a local Manang man that Westall made uh, when he was here in King George Sound. The rendering uh, of the man um, buys into, if you like, that kind of interest in the uh, late 18th century in, in neoclassicism in terms of the rendering of the, the human figure. Uh, that's seen quite a lot in the images that are made around Cook's voyages. It's also partly a result of uh, discoveries to do with the excavations of Pompeii and Herculaneum at the time that makes the classical world um, of great interest, particularly to the, the British mind. Um, but it also buys into the um, French notion of um, peoples who are untouched by civilization as being noble savages. Uh, in a sense. And so we have an image of um, this, young, this man from the King George Sound area that fits very much into that guise of um, a kind of warrior, noble, savage um, imagery. It's very um, respectful, I think, in its representation. 
of, um, of this man. Interestingly, the um, Westall works with um, the various elements that he draws during his voyages to then create other images as well. So the large image is a view of King George Sound uh, from 1802. And you can see that the image of the man from the pencil drawing has been uh, worked into um, the image here um, so that this become, it becomes the source material for this, um, this figure here occupying the land. Interestingly, the, uh, when Flinders and Westall and um, the rest were here at that time, they didn't actually encounter any um, of the local Manang women. So uh, this is a kind of interesting invention, really, of Westall's, on Westall's part in terms of um, that figure uh, in the landscape. Westall, as well as producing uh, watercolours and drawings as part of the travels, um, was also commissioned by the British Admiralty on return to the UK to make a series of paintings um, from the voyages, some of which would be used to illustrate Flinders' account. Um, and they, um, the paintings um, became the property of the Ministry of Defence. They still have them um, hanging in... Um, various residences and so on in London. So this is a view of part of King George III Sound on the south coast of New Holland, um, dated December 1801, paintings actually made between 1809 and 1812, so some years after um, uh, Westall's uh, return to Britain. And certainly the idea with these images is very much not that they actually are a scientific illustration of the voyages, but they actually, again, buy into a different understanding of um, the continent of Australia as being the um, site, perhaps, of a kind of romantic exoticism in a way, and that's very much um, uh, what Westall reflects in his images. And... I'll just pick this one apart a little bit to, um, to kind of illustrate uh, what's going on in the image making. So the topography itself is taken from this watercolour here. Um, you can see the kind of the landforms um, reflected uh, in, in both. But you can also see that there are some really quite significant differences from that source initial watercolour. Uh, we do, of course, probably most obviously have the introduction again of um, two Aboriginal figures, local Manang uh, people occupying the landscape. Um, they don't actually meet our gaze in any kind of way, so they're not actually seen as being kind of threatening or um, challenging a notion of who actually owns and occupies uh, the land. They become, in a sense, part of the incidental... Um, what's known as staffage, um, which is the people in kind of, of a landscape. But what you also find is that this kind of windswept dead branch here has actually turned into a more luscious kind of flowering of banksia. Uh, the introduction of this um, <coughs> eucalyptus here, which actually um, is based from this drawing, which we're still made in um, the Spencer Gulf. So nowhere near King George Sound. But its shape, its massing, if you like, is fit for purpose in terms of um, occupying that space in the landscape. This shrubby item here has also become a grass tree, um, more indicative of a typical landscape, if you like, for the area. Um, and this item has also been introduced into the landscape. Um, and while I know that we have uh, King Ear and the like in the area, this is actually taken from this drawing of Westall's, uh, which he made in Port Jackson. So again, we have this posited as being a view of the area of King George Sound. It's actually very much an amalgam of elements and images from around the continent, which Westall has brought together to make a kind of typical landscape or view, um, if you like, of the King George Sound area. It gets um, read uh, very much back in Europe as an image of a kind of pristine Arcadia or Australia. It's extrapolated from that that Australia is a pristine Arcadia. There are no questions about really um, ownership of land. It's been seen very much as a kind of open um, a slate through that image manipulation. Uh, moving on, the next visitor, um, well, 
we have um, Boda, who actually visits King George Sound area as well uh, in 1803, in February 1803. Um, unfortunately, no images. Uh, we have images from the um, Busselton area, from Lesseur, who was one of uh, Bodin's um, uh, artists, um, but not, not from this area. But Bodin also has brief contact with the local, um, uh, local Manang people. Interestingly, there is a moment of exchange of objects, but the French find that later on the gifts, as they think of them, have actually been discarded um, by the local people. Uh, but they also noted that um, they found a number of spears propped against a tree while they were um, surveying the land. So they took possession of them and um, took them back to France with them. The next uh, visitor is um, Philip Parker King, who interestingly is actually Australian born rather than European born um, surveyor first comes to this area in January in 1818. And King's orders are actually really quite uh, wide ranging. He's to find information about the climate, geography, um, zoological information, botanical information, geological information. And as you work down the list of his orders, at the very bottom um, is that he's also to find information about the local inhabitants and the local people. Um, on this particular visit in 1818, um, he didn't actually meet the local people, but certainly found traces of them. He writes about finding uh, fish traps around the area and talks about seeing smoke from fires um, in a number of, of regions. But he did, interestingly, as a um, surveyor artist himself, produce um, these lovely little watercolour images of the landscape of King George Sound um, and Oyster Harbour. And um, interestingly, and probably as befits um, the fact that there weren't any encounters, they're again completely unpopulated images. So we have the landscape um, presented to us. We have information about the geography, about the vegetation um, and so forth, but nothing and no trace about the people who actually um, live here and occupy the land. However, King is back in 1821, um, and it's a very different experience uh, for him and his crew. There are very extensive encounters and ongoing encounters between um, King uh, and the local people. Uh, and this, in fact, is, as far as I can tell, probably one of the first images um, that actually includes the local Manang people and Europeans together in the one image. So we have um, quite a few images of um, with Aboriginal people inserted into the image. But this is actually an encounter image, as its title tells us. It's an interview with natives at Oyster Harbour. So we have um, members of King's crew here um, in the boat and then local people on the shore here, also here, uh, and also... Um, this man fishing um, on the rocks in the foreground. And it's an interesting image because it does um, conform to some of the elements of the picturesque in terms of having um, scenes of interest here, but also it's a record, a historical record um, of an account. We have um, evidence of the tents um, here on the shore as well um, and um, the investigator uh, in, in the harbour. And it's very interesting... Um, to read um, Flinders' accounts of um, the various encounters. Um, this image itself was included in his published um, narrative of his surveying journey, uh, which was uh, illustrated by um, his, own, his own sketches. Um, and he talks in the account, as again you may have read or be familiar, a great deal about um, the encounters with the local people, but also them actually coming out to the ship about the exchange um, and bartering uh, for artefacts that took place between, um, uh, between the Europeans and, and the local people. And um, as Julian made mention, there, of course, is actually clear evidence of that exchange and bartering of objects um, in the um, local branch of the, the museum at the moment, and two of these objects in this slide um, are also included in the, the Yulman 
exhibition. King himself was very interested in um, Aboriginal um, activity and customs um, and so forth, and he um, uh, has in included in his um, published account a uh, quite extensive account of um, uh, tools and artefacts. He also includes a vocabulary of local, um, uh, local languages. Too. And what I wanted to show you here was how these particular objects that um, Bedwell in particular um, collected and, and took back to Britain and to his godfather who'd helped underwrite his presence on the, on the voyage um, have, diff have different lives. So this is a page from one of King's um, uh, kind of later compiled sketchbooks which I found quite fascinating. It's in the State Library of New South Wales collection and we have here King's watercolours of these objects, which then later become reproduced in the published um, account of his survey. They've been cut out of the, the paper um, that they were originally drawn on and stuck down on this page, bizarrely with um, image from Peru. Uh, this is from the northwest coast. Um, and um, this is actually not his, but somebody else's printed um, image of Cape Horn. So these um, objects that have a very particular life and significance have been disassociated from the other images that they were produced with and stuck down in this kind of weird kind of scrapbook uh, manner. What I find also very disconcerting is that this is actually upside down. Um, as well as the fact that these objects have been rotated to kind of fit into the kind of the arrangement of images on the page. Um, very different, at least, from this uh, account, from the um, published account um, by King of some of the objects that were actually uh, collected at the time. And as I said, he does write in his journals um, about the collecting of, of the objects um, and talks about how... Um, uh, Mr. Bedwell, in particular, purchased spears and other other weapons. Um, but he also writes about how Jack, who was um, one of the the local um, men that they'd befriended during during the time, um, actually towards the end of the stay, took to Bedwell a throwing stick, which is most likely this um, object um, that had been pre previously concealed, um, and. Um, there was certainly a sense in, in um, King's writing about it that it was because of the trust that had been built up between um, uh, Bedwell um, and the local people that eventually um, uh, some of the objects that were kind of um, exchanged uh, moved beyond um, the kind of the spears in particular and the, and the knives to important objects as well, like um, like this one. So following on from King's. Um, visit. Uh, we have the French in King George Sound in October 1826. Louis de Sanson, the artist uh, on board the Astrolabe um, under the command of Dumont de Ville and um, they spend 10 days in, um, in King George Sound uh, setting up uh, observatory um, obviously for um, making scientific observation uh, and um, and um, uh, tents for an encampment and so on. Uh, one of their um, tasks, as with many um, of the explorers and voyagers, is actually taking on fresh water, um, which is in what is being depicted in this um, image here. And interestingly, again, we have images where we have the local Manang people um, working with Europeans, and so... Um, this uh, inclusion of these figures in, suggests that it's actually the local people who have helped the French to the source of fresh water who are actually actively working with them in the task of actually um, collecting the fresh water and taking it, um, taking it back to um, the ships. Um, certainly in writing about the voyages, um, uh, Dumont de Ville talks about uh, encounters with the local people and this is actually the point at which there is the first written recorded um, meeting with Mokare as well which is um, between um, uh, him and uh, his family uh, and the French and um, de saint and two others from the French crew actually spend uh, a night on shore um, camped alongside Mokare's family um, making um, you know, observations and engaging with them uh, and 
this is partly what's represented in this image. So we have the kind of the French tent um, and um, the local Manang um, structure. And again, then here, front and centre of this image, uh, image of kind of exchange and um, meeting and conversation, if you like, between um, the local local people and um, the French explorers uh, who were uh, in harbour at the time, and also a recording of different um, different activities. De Sanson, as well as those um, exchange or encounter uh, images, also. Um, these images published in 1835, beautiful drawn images which uh, record um, the fish traps on what was known as Frenchman's River, but Calgan River um, area here. Um, very much an image of, as I referred to earlier, of a kind of um, idyllic Arcadia. Um, we have items of natural history as well as the local people um, uh, at that, that point with this kind of very romanticised uh, image of um, of the landscape again falling into that kind of, both images fall into that picturesque model that I've referred to of trees framing the view um, figures adding kind of some interest to the scene interestingly we still have the uh, moored ships in the in the view um, there in this um, lightly rendered um, scene de Sanson also made uh, other images um, of the local people in his time here. And I would very much like uh, to um, get to the um, French National Archives where the original drawings are held because I would like to see the original drawing for this because I have some question about how much the hand of the kind of European engraver has perhaps manipulated the original um, images on which it is, this one is based. Um, as I said, um, de Sanson and two others spent time on shore with Makari's family. Um, there were two occasions as well where the local Manang people um, spent some time on board ship with the French. And what this scene depicts is this man who spent time on board ship, who's now in his European clothing, coming back to the land and showing um, those who remained behind um, his trinkets. Uh, that the French um, had given him. And there's a very um, disconcerting, I think, image making going on in this particular image where um, the, the difference between the representation of the local people and the French people is really quite extreme, um, that we have this kind of odd figure uh, in the middle who kind of is bridging both worlds, but in a very, very different way from the way that the written account kind of talks about how the encounter between... Um, the French and um, uh, Mokare and his family uh, took place. And we have also this image on the left, sorry, right, um, by de Sanson, which actually individually um, shows individual, sorry, portraits of individuals. So we have the image of um, Patet here um, and um, Yalapul, and this is Mokare himself. Um, in um, de Sanson's rendering. So this is very the first time where actual known named individuals um, in the King George Sound area are actually recorded and depicted and that their image is then um, uh, published uh, for circulation in Europe. So since we've got to 1826, um, it's also the year of um, the British garrison arrival and settlement under Lockyer. And on, as part of that um, initial um, settlement with Lockyer, we also have the arrival of um, Isaac Scott Nind, I think that's how, the correct pronunciation, but do correct me if I get it wrong, um, who, who was a surgeon but also made uh, a series of watercolour images of, um, of King George um, Sound um, in the late 18... Um, 20s, I think there is um, landscape from 1827, two images from 1828, and um, this one from 1829. I've only included the ones that actually uh, depict the settlement. Here at a distance, the settlement, um, you can see there nestled within its spectacular um, geographic location. And then here, another more detailed view closer up of the settlement from 1829. Um, Interestingly, um, Nind um, 
published, or it was published in 1831, um, a very lengthy account that he wrote as a description, it was entitled Description of the Natives um, from the King George Sound area, where he set out in very, very great detail accounts of um, customary practices, the way that um, the local Menang people actually looked, um, how they approached hunting, a whole range of um, activities. There's a very, very extensive vocabulary as well included in that um, that. Um, account that was published in 1831 and I find it very interesting given that he is so interested and is making those detailed and extensive observations um, of the local people that also given that there is quite a high level of engagement between or encountering between the garrison um, and the local people that again they're completely absent from Nine's images of King George Sound. The landscapes, the pure landscapes have no human um, occupation or presence. Um, these we have signs of the European kind of intervention and action on the land, but no image is of um, Makare and his family and, and the local people. And there's clearly, as I've said, a very um, strong and active engagement across there. Colet Barker writes in his journals about his conversations with Makare. Um, and um, he's all, not the only one to, to kind of make reference to that. Um, so kind of interesting to think about that absence, that visual absence from the record when there's such a strong kind of written record um, referring to it. Robert Dale is also um, in uh, King George Sound area or in Albany, probably for about roughly five months in 1832. Um, like Nine, he also um, publishes a pamphlet which talks about uh, the local Menang people. It's published to accompany um, this extraordinary object here, which is a large panorama um, of King George Sound, uh, which was published in Britain in um, 1834. And it... Um, fairly self-evidently, um, gives that 360-degree view of um, Oyster Harbour Sound and Princess Royal Harbour area. It also um, contains within it uh, a number of images of um, the local Aboriginal people. There are also, this is a detail from it, scenes of encounter um, and exchange, again, between... Um, the members of the garrison and, and the local people. Um, so we have this very clear kind of shaking hands image, which is actually in some ways a reference to um, the phrase that Mokare uses uh, when talking to Colet Barker about the, um, in, the exchange and the conversations between uh, the local people and um, Europeans. Um, we have um, this guy coming back from um, a hunt, uh, encounter again um, with this chap and the local people. And this figure here is actually identified by Dale as being Nakina, um, who is Makare's brother, who um, in a sense takes over kind of leadership of the family following Makare's death in 1831. Uh, Dale actually describes him um, as the chief of the King George tribe and goes on to say that he'd been so far reclaimed from his former mode of life as to live almost entirely at the settlement, but his wandering propensities at last prevailed, and he rejoined his companions in the woods, where he shortly afterwards died. And I think the tone of Dale's account is quite different from Nine's account, and there is... Um, more of a kind of subtext of when you get um, that account of Nakina that it's like he'd moved away from the good influence of the European, um, had gone back to his kind of um, original way of life and that therefore obviously he died because that's the, the expected outcome of that, that kind of um, change in behaviour or that rejection, if you like, of kind of the civilising influence of um, the European presence that, that Dale is part of. Um, <coughs> And there are a number of points in Dale's account where um, he makes very disparaging comments about the Aboriginal people in the course of his account of their customs and description of um, hunting um, and so forth. We have also, though, in Dale's panorama down here, in, which lurks right down there in that corner of the panorama, um, this is the old farm, Strawberry Hill. So this is a kind of first... Um, 
if you like, visual uh, reputa- representation of um, Old Farm. And um, this is the image um, from the 1840s of um, Old Farm Strawberry Hill, um, which I'd like to um, finish with a kind of discussion and, and I'll say analysis, analysis of, but I'm probably going to raise a number of questions about it as much as I think I can probably answer um, uh, some of those. So as Julian said, um, the land where um, Odd Farm Strawberry Hill is located was previously a campsite before it became um, the government farm. It was first occupied by Alexander Colley, uh, who was, um, no doubt you're aware, was also had very, very good and um, close, friendly um, relationships with Mokare. Uh, the farm was acquired by Sir Richard Spencer in 1833. Um, at the time that he acquired it, there were six acres of cleared land. Um, the Spencer family uh, added an additional 1,400 acres of cleared land, and part of Spencer's project was also to um, undertake a a building um, activity and enlarge the buildings that are on site. And certainly this two-storey edifice here is part of um, that activity. Uh, The image probably dates from the the 1840s. It's... um, we think a privately made image, so made for kind of circulation pretty much within the family. And for me, one of the really interesting questions about it, given that um, as a kind of private audience, largely private audience for it, um, as a kind of personal, almost diary image um, representing the scene, is how much does it show a kind of real real lived uh, scene and experience or how much is the image showing us perhaps a kind of um, model or um, ideal of cohabitation um, between the local um, Manang people and um, the Spencer family who are um, the owners and occupiers of the land at this point. Strawberry Hill, when it's visited during the 30s and 40s, is... um, described by a number of visitors as having all the attributes of an English uh, gentleman's house. Um, I think it surprises um, some of those visitors in their accounts to find things like pianos and the like, um, and rose gardens, but um, they did encounter that. And one of the things I first want to suggest with this image is that it fits very much into um, a language of image making about um, country properties and... um, country houses. Um, It's a body of images that appeared quite often in a printed form. Uh, Westall, for example, when he returned um, to the UK following his voyages with Flinders, uh, one of the things that he did was actually make a um, book with a series of images of um, English country houses, much in the vein of this image up here, which is the scene of a country house in, um, in Cornwall. Uh, scenes of the colonies also um, were regularly heavily populated with images of residences as well. So in the lower left-hand corner we have from the 1820s uh, an image by the convict artist Joseph Lysett of the residence of John MacArthur. Um, and you can see, I think, in all three images that there are some very similar things going on uh, in all of them. We have the elements of the picturesque with the um, the framing of um, the trees and the construction of the viewpoint. All of them are made at a time where the house is set off um, into the distance somewhat. Early images of country houses, they were more kind of front and centre and we got a lot of information about the architecture. Um, but during the 19th century, they get pushed back uh, more into the mid-ground um, of the image. Uh, We then start to have the inclusion of figures um, within the scene um, that start to give us some more information about those houses as well. So in this top image from Cornwall, interestingly, these are the young members of the family who stop to have a chat with the gardener. So what you have is a kind of slightly bucolic scene, but also a kind of class-based scene of exchange between uh, the owners of uh, Morville, 
the gentlemen's residents in Cornwall and those who are actually working the land for them and um, maintaining um, uh, the image and the, and the grounds and so forth. I think you have similar um, uh, action, if you like, with the figures here, in particular this group of uh, figures here who seem to be actually working uh, the ground um, for, the, for the Spencer family. Uh, in this image. In license image, we have slightly different, um, we have figures here um, that are quite kind of popular in these kind of images who are actually occupying the landscape, um, pointing out um, scenes. And the fact that these figures also tend to have their back towards us, they become substitute figures, so they help us actually enter into that landscape and become part of that, that landscape. And that's part of what happens in all these images with the inclusion of figures that helps us actually enter into um, that landscape and become part of it. So in some ways, initially, this um, watercolour a Strawberry Hill, although probably made by an amateur for the family, uh, is somebody who's very much aware of this body of image types and how one actually constructs an image of a, um, a country home or property, be it uh, in the colonies of Australia or um, back in the UK. There are also, I mean, one of the really significant and key aspects um, of the image is and I'll talk uh, a bit more with a larger image um, about them some more, the inclusion of this group of Aboriginal figures um, within the image. Uh, and certainly the records show that there's a constant Aboriginal presence at um, Old Farm, Strawberry Hill, under the, um, the Spencer family, um, and that they're certainly used to help um, work on the land, um, work with Richard Spencer and his family improving the property. Uh, Spencer seems to have um, a kind of patrician sense that he has an obligation also to support um, uh, some of the, um, the local Manang people, particularly women and children, and their accounts of him giving rations and food um, to particular individuals. But there are also accounts of the family actually setting traps in the vegetable garden to stop uh, the theft of um, particularly potatoes, referred to, but um, the vegetables as well. And so um, I wanted to look at some, also some other images of um, farms and settlements that uh, included the presence of Aboriginal people um, within them. This image here on the right is an image of um, Barrett Leonard's property uh, in the Swan River area from around the same period as the Strawberry um, Hill image. Um, we have again the property in the centre of the image. Interestingly, very clear fencing and containment of the landscape, um, which we do have a little bit hinted at um, uh, in Strawberry Hill, but it's very clear here. We have the European possessions, the horses contained within that cleared landscape. There's an image of rim barking um, of a tree. But then there is on the periphery this um, uh, figure of an Aboriginal man um, uh, with a... Um, throwing a spear. And um, I think that certainly this fencing becomes a signifier of very clear demarcation between the European uh, occupied, possessed world and the original owners of the land who are being literally, in the, the case of this image, pushed to the edges or the corners um, of that landscape. And so there's a very different relationship probably going on between this figure and um, what's happening here with the Barrett Leonard property and this relationship that's taking place um, uh, on Strawberry Hill. Uh, images of um, engagement um, and are rare but are not unique to that image. Um, so from here, this is another image from the 1840s, uh, South Australian image by Martha um, Berkeley, who was a um, professionally trained um, artist working as a woman in Adelaide at the time, which was, um, that was fairly rare. Um, but what we have in the corner here is actually an image of one of um, Berkeley's children in the company of an Aboriginal family um, walking together um, on the outskirts of the, the city of Adelaide, a very um, comfortable, relaxed image of engagement and exchange between, in this case, between the, um, the European child and um, uh, the Aboriginal figures depicted.
uh, some slightly um, later images. On the top we have uh, Benson um, out near bailing up from 1864 uh, and also an image by Eugene von Gerard, um, also from the 1860s. And I just wanted to look at these because, again, to think about... Um, in this case, the placement of the figures within the landscape. So we have the figure of a European returning to the homestead on horseback here, but there is also the presence um, of an Aboriginal man here in the landscape, other members of the family kind of front confronting them um, on the return home. And um, just thinking about the placement of those figures um, in relation to that homestead and that European occupation of the landscape. It's a much more uh, wooded image and scene, although interestingly the xanthoreas in the foreground are actually being uh, uh, decapitated in that case and knocked down. So there is a sense of that kind of destruction of uh, the landscape and I think by implication certainly the way of life of the, um, the local Aboriginal people whose land uh, it was that the Europeans are um, coming to occupy. And it seems to be similar to what is um, occurring in this image by Von Garage, certainly um, in Victoria in this case, not a West Australian image, um, but it's... Um, the painting's entitled Mr King's Station and um, we don't actually, in this version, have an image of the property, um, the, the outbuildings, um, the architecture at all. We have here in the background, um, this is actually King's Gardener and one of King's children, um, again up by a fence line in the, in the landscape. But we have an image here um, of the... Um, original traditional occupiers of that land. Um, they, um, King actually had a, a fairly um, largely harmonious relationship with the, the local people in the area um, where he had his property. But in this case, by the 1860s, Von Gerard's painting becomes... It's like a memento mori, I think, in many ways. We have um, this kind of... It's, as though it's capturing a kind of passing moment in time with these figures. It's a moment of transition so that the man uh, still has his, um, his spear and so on with him. He's still actually wearing a, a kangaroo skin cloak. Uh, the seated woman um, is actually wearing a government issue blanket, so you already have a contrast between um, the way of life that she's part of um, with the British government through Victoria. The child actually has a dead parrot um, at its feet as well, so there is very much a sense of that kind of passing moment uh, in time, it being a um, moment of um, change on the landscape. So I'd just like to finish up again um, with looking um, again at this image of Strawberry Hill and um, asking... Um, as I said, a series of questions about it. I think the most important, or perhaps the most telling thing in looking at an image like this is to kind of start to ask um, what's actually depicted or what's been uh, recorded in the image. I think, um, as I've probably indicated as I've been speaking, that really the key uh, to understanding the image is in um, the figures depicted in the image um, because, um, and it's probably partly to do with the skills of the, the, um, the author or the artist of the image, but we don't have um, individual representations or portraits of individuals. We have kind of indications of a group of figures. So this is presumably um, the members of the um, Spencer, extended Spencer family. Um, again, these stand in as a kind of typical image of the, um, the local um, people. Um, there are also, as I indicated, some kind of just vaguely sketched in uh, images of um, what appear to be people um, at work in the, the ground there. Um, and so one of the um, questions to ask is, so where are the, where are the people actually placed um, within the image? And although the Europeans um, and the Aboriginal figures occupy, in a sense, the same ground um, of the image. They certainly occupy the, um, the same cleared space that the farm occupies. There really isn't any interaction between them. There's quite, this is quite a gulf of separation between um, the, the two groups. I think it's um, kind of interesting to note that it, 
gives the sense of a kind of um, harmonious presence. Um, there are strangely for me kind of echoes of Noah's Ark. I kind of look at these pairings of animals with the horses and the cattle and the sheep and the dogs and even almost the pairing of the figures. Like it's some kind of um, image of um, the whole world in a sense is kind of, you know, that kind of, in a sense, that sense, reference to Noah's Ark for me, it becomes a kind of statement about this is the world as, as we know it kind of depicted. And certainly you have. Um, various activity taking place between the Aboriginal uh, the figures here. The Europeans seem more static in their um, procession. They're presumably they're off working, walking rather somewhere. Interestingly, we have kind of indications of firearms here, but also spears present here, but there's no sense of a kind of potential hostility or tension in spite of the, that kind of presence of um, from weaponry within the scene. Um, and I'd argue that really what we have in the in the image is there isn't any sense of that um, of um, dispossession conveyed in the image. That there's probably a sense more of um, certainly from that kind of Spencer point of view, um, a feeling of kind of harmony. Um, or at least not threat um, taking place in the image, and that there's probably the European occupation of the land that's actually allowed that. Um, sense of harmony to prevail and that that um, in itself is probably an end result of that kind of prior uh, contact history between the local Manang people and um, the early European settlers of the King George um, Sound Albany area. And I think that's kind of probably enough from me. So thank you. <laughs>